priceless, um, gifts that truly have no price tag on them because they come to us from God. And gifts that since they come to us from God, we can then give out to others. Most of you know uh, that these sermons are written in, in what we call a, a writing team setting, which means that the pastors from all of our network churches uh, and a couple of other churches come together and we, and we seek the Lord for what He would have us to say and we'll come up with a, with a theme for a series and then we'll come up with a, a, um, a, a set of, of sermons in ty- inside of that series and then the final step is to lay out the outline for all of the sermons, each individual sermon in that series. And that's the way our sermons are put together. You can imagine that we have to do this well ahead of time. And, um, and so, honestly, the, the theme or the titles for the ser- sermons can be done as much as six months ahead of time. Uh, for a case in point, uh, we've written titles and themes all the way through Easter and are beginning to think in terms of themes past Easter. So we're that far ahead with themes. The outlines themselves can be as much as, uh, as, much as two to six weeks ahead of time, depending on where we are in our writing process. I say all that to say this. The sermon series you are currently hearing was put together a month or two ago, and uh, the, even down to the outlines put together a month or two ago. And yet, somehow, God has dropped us in His providence right in the middle of the current conversation inside of our culture. And, and I say all of that because I believe that what God has given us in this series is a way to process what we are experiencing in our culture right now. And I believe that Christmas is a tremendous way for us to package and understand and get our hands around what we are dealing with inside of our culture at this moment. You see, inside of our culture right now, we are dealing with a lot of huge issues. In fact, in the weeks to come, you will hear some massive, important debates taking place. These debates will be important. They they, they are items and issues that truly matter inside of our culture. We need to have the discussions we're about to have. Because of things like what happened in Newtown, Connecticut, because of the fact that we we know an NFL player recently killed killed his girlfriend and then went and killed himself in front of his coaches, because of the fact that People are shooting guns at one another in the district over shoes. These things cause us to have debates within our culture. And these debates are important. And the debates we're going to have are debates like gun control. It's an important debate. We should have that debate within our culture. We're going to have debates about things like media and the influence of the media over how we think and how we act. That's an important debate. We need to have that debate. We're going to have debates in the next few months over how we deal with people with mental illness within our culture. It's an important debate. We won't settle these issues over the next few months. We just won't. We've been having these debates for a few hundred years already. We'll continue to have them for for hundreds of years to come. But they're important things for us to understand and unpack and deal with over and over and over again, especially in light of of things like what we've experienced over the last few months. But I fear, I fear that we will never get to the actual core of the issue. Now, let me set your mind at ease. Here on the day before Christmas Eve, I am not about to have a political sermon. However, I can tell you what's at the core of our issue. At the core of our issue is the fact that for at least a few decades, we have been working hard at devaluing human life. And the cheaper human life becomes, the more often we will watch it snuffed out for the simplest and stupidest of reasons. Human life is devalued in our culture for many, many, many different reasons. I'm not, again, going to have a political discussion this morning. I'm just here to give you a simple statement. Human life is not valued as highly as it once was. And therefore, in some people's minds, human life might be worth less than a really cool pair of shoes. Human life might be worth less than my emotions or my feelings or my anger. 
We must understand that human beings have a value that is beyond anything we can measure. Some of you are going, no, 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 no. <clears throat> Everything can be measured. And, and value has to come from somewhere, Pastor Mike. So just don't, just, just, uh, you're, you're having one of those odd discussions. Okay, let's have the more logical debate. Value must be established somehow. That's a fair statement. We need to understand what is the value of a human life. And there are many ways we could do that. We could go with economic value. I can tell you that insurance companies, not just insurance companies, not just private insurance companies, but nations that have uh, socialized medicine, that these nations that offer insurance and insurance companies go together and they have companies or people that they pay to study these things and answer this question. How is money best spent when it comes to someone's health care? And here's how you answer that question. What is the value of one year of quality human life? Did you know that people have answered that question? Did you know people have studied that and they've come up with an answer to that question? I can give you the answer to that question. The standardized statement for what is the value of one quality year of life for a human being is $50,000. It's kind of sobering, isn't it? $50,000 is the value of one year of human life, quality human life. Basically what that means is if we can offer you a treatment for $50,000 or less, and that treatment will gain you one quality year of life, then that money is well spent. However, if that treatment is $75,000 and we only get one year of quality human life in return, oh, take that journey. Some would argue that that number should be higher given, given the American standard that we live at today. And some have argued for a number as high as 129000 At any rate, there's a number out there. You say, well, Pastor, that's not really a good way to measure that because that's talking about health care. Okay, let's go with a different economic measurement. In 2005, the average American had the capacity of earning just over $39,000 per year. Therefore, I could say that the value of a one year of a human life in the United States of America would be somewhere around 39000 but that's actually not a true statement because that's the number for people with a college degree. So if you don't have a college degree, your earning potential dropped to about 32000 per year, so I guess your life is less valuable than someone who has a piece of paper hanging on their wall. Wow, that doesn't seem fair, does it? That doesn't seem like a good measurement. I could go with lifetime earning potential if you want, and then we could diminish it, average lifetime earning potential if you'd like, and then we could diminish it by year using an average lifespan. So, you know, your, your, your value decreases as your hair releases. <clears throat> Some of you are going, well, Pastor Mike, I don't, think, I don't think this is a fair conversation at all. We should not measure the value of human life by dollars. Okay, that's fair. A lot of people believe that. Let's don't do that. Let's measure the value of a human life by what kind of benefit or quality it brings to the society in which we live. In other words, let's measure ourselves against how much we add to society. Because now this is a better way to do it. Because artists, for instance... An artist would be maybe not able to make a lot of money, and so their economic value may be low, but they do bring a lot of joy into our lives, and so certain artists that don't make a lot of money, they do bring joy, so there's more value to those people. Thinkers uh, may not make a lot of money, and yet thinkers are important in our society, so maybe thinkers, well, wait, you know, oh, wait, I got, hold on. Thinkers and artists are valuable as long as what they are thinking and drawing about uh, is what we as a society have considered as important. And if what they're thinking and drawing about is not what we think is important, or maybe even is contrary to what we think is important, then they're not only not valuable, they're dangerous and they need to be done away with. See the problem? I heard one man, <clears throat> you said, well, okay, let's leave both of those, Pastor. Let's, let's go a different route. I heard one man who is considered a thinker in this society. I don't really consider him a thinker. I think he's an idiot, but that's just my thought. Um, he's important. He's just not smart. But, um, and if you want to know who I'm talking about, because I don't mind the fact that I'm insulting this person, you can ask me afterwards, because I'm not going to tell you his name. His initials are Bill Maher. And... Um, <laughs> 
Did I say that? Yeah, it's going to be on video too. So if y'all know him, tell him to watch the video. Anyway, um, but he says that he said he, someone was on a program with him and said, you know, there's uh, so it's something about God-given rights. And he said, there's no such thing as God-given rights. The only rights you have are the rights given to you by the government. Okay, let's go there. Let's say that your value comes from your citizenship. The problem with that is we would have to assume as we look around the planet that that would mean that certain citizenships have greater value than other citizenships. Now, that works for us because we're Americans. We have somewhere near the gold standard of citizenship. So we're okay with this standard today, but our great-grandchildren may not be because, quite honestly, the gold standard of citizenship a few thousand years ago was Roman. In fact, it saved, it saved the Apostle Paul's life, the fact that he was a Roman citizen. But your Roman citizenship today wouldn't be worth anything. It would mean nothing because the Roman, that, that doesn't exist anymore. And what happens when our citizenship is not the first class standard that we'd wish it was? See, we're talking about the value of human life, not the value of American life. We're talking about the value of human life, not the value of one people group. See, people get value from places other than governments because governments can decide that they, don't, they no longer like certain types of people. International governments can decide they, don't, they no longer like certain types of it, government. Societies can decide they don't like certain thoughts or certain art forms. It's very easy for us to lose our ability to create economic value. So if our value is based in any of those things, our value is not lasting. I said, Pastor, come on. This is really heavy. It's Christmas. Talk about the baby Jesus. Talk about angels. Talk about shepherds. Okay. But might I suggest... I already have been. Might I suggest that the Christmas story is the answer to the question, why do we have value? Might I suggest that the Christmas story proves that as human beings, we have value. Look at this screen. I'm going to start us reading kind of in the middle of this chapter. Let's read together. Start at the beginning here. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were terrified. Now, wait, wait, wait. You know where we're at, right? You know where we're at? There's going to be an announcement. There's going to be a big, important announcement. We're at the place in the Christmas story where the angels begin to announce the arrival of Jesus. Where do you suppose they would do that? Don't, 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 don't you think if you were going to announce the arrival of the Messiah, the arrival of, uh, of the King, the arrival of the Promised One, the arrival of God Himself, don't you think you'd do that, I don't know, in a university where people think? Don't you think you'd do that in Congress? Of course, nothing gets out of Congress, so it might not work there. Don't, don't you think you would do that in a more important place or, or, or around important people? And yet, that's not where this announcement takes place. The glory of the Lord shone around them. Who? Shepherds. And not just any shepherds. The minimum wage shepherds. The third shift shepherds. We're not even talking about the upper crust shepherds. These are the shepherds who don't have enough tenure to get off the night shift. These guys have been forgotten. They're sitting out in the field. Nobody's thinking about them. Nobody's sitting at home going, wonder how the shepherds are doing. And yet to them... The angel of the Lord appears. And listen to those words. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. Read with me after they were terrified. We'll pick up with but thee. Here, here we go. 
But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Can I pause? A lot of people say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have questions. No, you're not. You see that? You know the first words out of every angel's mouth? Don't be afraid. Calm down. Chill out. Get up. (laughs) So what's our reaction going to be when we get to heaven? We are going to freak out. This is going to be... I don't know, maybe a couple thousand years before you get even a word out. I don't know. I don't know how this works, but I just know this. Every time every human being in Scripture sees an angel of the Lord or God himself, they freak out. They either pass out or they pee themselves. Let's keep going. (laughs) I ain't making that up. Come on, let's keep going. Anyway, today, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And the angel of the Lord appeared. Well, that's the wrong one. (laughs) Go here. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Let's stop there. Let me tell you why this sermon brings us to the very heart of our debate in our culture right now. See, the very fact that Jesus comes to the earth reminds us of something and then teaches us some other things. It reminds us of a story in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, where God creates the planet. You should read this story sometime, because it's very clear within that story that God creates mankind, creates human beings for a very special purpose. It's very clear in that story that God creates human beings differently than he does everything else. It's very clear in that story that God created us, every one of us. Let me tell you what that means. What that means is that God, I want you to hear this, God imagined you. There was a point somewhere in heaven There was a point somewhere in the reality of God where he sat down and he said, I'm going to make another human. I'm going to make another person. And this one I'm going to make different from all the other ones. And before you even existed, the God of the universe stopped and imagined you. Think about that for just a moment. Think about the fact that the God of heaven actually took the time to think through what you would look like, to think through what you would act like, to think through what your preferences would be and what your ideas would be, to think through what would bring you joy and what would bring you pain, to think through how you would live your life. The God of heaven designed you, and he designed you uniquely. Do you understand what I'm saying here? I'm saying here that you, no matter what your parents told you, are not a mistake. You're not an accident. God planned you. He designed you. He created you. In the creative mind of who God is, He thought of you. And He brought you into being. He imagined you. He created you. Y'all, i got to tell you something. There's a lot of stuff in my house that has little to no value. There's a lot of stuff in my house that, you know, whatever. If, you, if, 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 if it's gone, it doesn't mean anything. But there are a few things in my house that have tremendous value to me that you would view as worthless. There are, and there are things in my house that either I imagined and created myself and for some reason, for whatever reason, they have great value because of what I imagined and how I did that and the reason I did that. All of that has value to me. There are some things that my children imagined and created that we have on, on, on Tina's dresser is this little, um, oh, dish thing. It's not um, Beautiful. It's clay. Most of you are parents, have one of these. One of my boys made it when they were in school. I, if I, I, you know, y'all, and I, I know my sons are probably in here, so I'm not, I don't mean to offend anybody, but it probably wouldn't fetch much at a yard sale.
but it has great value to me. Why? Because my son imagined it. And with his hands, he formed it. And with his creativeness, he designed it. And in love for his parents, he presented it. I doubt any of you make enough money to buy that from me. If anybody wants to try. <laughs> but I doubt it. <laughs> Has no value to you. But oh, it means something to me. What if God sees us that way? Oh, let me pause. God sees us that way. That's how God views you. You have value because you were imagined and created by the very hand and mind of God. Oh, but you see, I'm not done yet. Because, you know, sometimes you can create things and then walk away from them. There are some things that you created that it's not a big deal. You created it, fine, whatever. You walk away, you forget you ever did it. It's gone. It doesn't matter anymore. Maybe God did that with us. In fact, there's a whole theology that argues that. It's called deism. It basically says that God created the earth, created humankind, and then turned around and walked away, kicked back in his cosmic easy chair, and said, well, this ought to be fun. Let's see how this works out. And God does nothing. This is the Bette Midler God when she sings God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. God is not watching us from a distance. That's not how it works. And we know that because not only did God imagine you, God also relates to you. He understands you. He gets what you're going through. He understands your situation. He understands your pain. He understands your issues. He understands what you are going through. Why? Because he relates to who you are. Why? Because he became like you. This is the story of Christmas. This is the story of Christmas. That God relates to us because he became like us. He became one of us. When Jesus is born in that manger, he is born, listen to me, he is born 100% human. Say, no, 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 Pastor, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean he's born 100% human? He's God. Yes, he is. He's born 100% God. Wait, 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 Pastor, 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 wait a minute, you're getting confused. Because you said he was 100% human. Yes, he is. He's 100% human. But wait, Pastor, you said he's 100% God. Yes, he is. So, well, which one is it? Yes. (laughs) Jesus is 200%. He's 100% God, and he's 100% man. This is important because as 100% God, he has authority over sin and death and hell. But as 100% man, he has position to understand, relate to, and forgive and pay the price for sin. He gets it. Some of you are saying, well, God doesn't understand what I feel. Yes, he does. He's been rejected. He's been spit on. He's been called a liar. He's been ignored. He's been set aside. He had to be born in a manger. He's been homeless. Have you dealt with that one before? He's been all of those things. The Bible says he's been tempted in every way, just as we are. I don't know how all that works. I don't understand everything I know. But I know that's what the Bible says. That means Jesus relates to me. That means when I hurt, when I fall aside, when I don't quite know what to do next, Jesus relates to where I'm at. When I'm struggling in life, Jesus relates to where I'm at. In fact, can I tell you something? I need you to hear me. You are so valuable that not only did God in his infinite creativity imagine you and build you, when he saw that you were in trouble, 
He came to help you. He left the throne of heaven to be born in a manger on earth to walk alongside the creation that had rejected him. Process that thought for just a minute. How much are you worth? What is your value? Well, let me give you an answer to that question. The life of the God of heaven is my value. Because that's what he chose to pay for each and every one of us. You say, no, pastor, no, pastor. He chose to pay that for you, not me. He chose to pay that for Pastor Aaron, not me. He chose to pay that for somebody else, not me. He might have paid that for Billy Graham, but not me. No, 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 no. God died for all of us. You say, well, what, what does that mean? Hmm. Let's go to the last one. I want you to read this verse that goes with the last point with me. Let's read this together. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When we were writing this sermon, I, I began to struggle with this, these words. On whom his favor rests. Who is that? Because we really want to unpack that. You know, we, we know what we want the answer to be, but we really want to unpack that. We want to chase that down. We want to figure out who is that. Does his favor rest on, on, on rich men? Does his favor rest just on smart men? Does his favor rest just on powerful men? Does his favor rest just on Jewish men? Because that's what he was. Does his favor rest on, well, let's try this. Does his favor rest on just men? What does this mean? And as I unpacked it, I have to tell you that <clears throat> Scripture in many ways leaves this terribly vague. Which, by the way, I think is brilliant. It's not just men. The word here is mankind. It means all humanity, all human beings. And yet it leaves it vague and it's difficult to unpack. And what do you do with it? And, and i got to tell you, this statement spoken of Jesus at the beginning of his life, maybe is best unpacked by Jesus later on in his life. When I think he unpacks the answer to this question. Because he says in John, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. That, here's the answer to the question, you ready? Here's the answer to our question. That whoever believes in him. It doesn't say that whichever Jewish guy believes in him. It doesn't say that whichever rich guy believes in him. It doesn't say that whichever powerful guy that believes in him. It doesn't say whichever male guy believes in him. It says whoever, which is a universal phrase. And the answer to the question spoken by the angel is best given by Jesus when he says, I have come to die for everyone. And the Bible then says, for the, for, for the Father did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. You know what the answer to the question is? God favors you. God favors you. And he proved that by being the one who died for you. <clears throat> During Wednesday night dinners, Miss Carlita would meet me at the door out here. And I, I would always walk in and I would say, I would say, how are you doing tonight? She said, I'm doing wonderful, blessed and highly favored, she would say. <laughs> she said, and today I'm my daddy's favorite. Well, she said that to me a couple times. <clears throat> and then I said, wait, 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 I came in one time, I said, how are you doing? She said, blessed and highly favored, and I interrupted her. And I said, no, today's my day. <laughs> she started laughing at me, and she said, yeah, okay, okay, today's your day. Today you're your daddy's favorite. Y'all, listen to me, listen to me, look at me. Everybody look up here. You are your father's favorite. You are. You are 
highly favored. You say, how do I know that? Because the God of heaven saw you as so valuable that he came to this earth giving up his throne to walk with you and to ultimately die for you. You matter. You, listen carefully, and every other human being on this planet have value because you are created by a God who loved you so much he walked with you and cared so much for you he gave his life for you. That is a place that human value can be set and the value of it will never move. Oh, make no doubt about it. Our economic power comes and goes, but our value is not based in our economic power. My self-worth is not connected to my net worth. Somebody say amen. Amen. That's good news. My, my, My value is not based in whether or not this society thinks I'm important. This society can think I am a pariah within it, and yet, in the face of God, I have value. Regardless of what the society may think, they may think I'm wrong, they may think I'm nuts, but God says I have value. The truth is, regardless, and listen, I want you to hear me, i got to say this right, I am proud to be an American, amen? However, when, the, when proud to be an American is no longer the proper phrase, I still have value because my value is not dependent on the continent in which I was born. My value is dependent on the Savior who gave his life for me. And the value of every human being is tied up in that same place. And Christmas tells us a story of a God who came to live amongst and save a world that he created. And he gave his life for them. Now let me tell you what some of you are about to go do. Some of you in the next few days are going to experience the joy of having people around you. You're going to have family around you. There's not going to be a doubt in your mind that you are loved. You are cared for. There won't be a doubt in your mind that you are important on this planet. Because you will, in the food, in the time, in the hugs, in the, in the gifts, you will be validated by your importance and your value almost minute by minute over the next few days. If that's you, I'm begging you, start right now thanking the Lord God in heaven above for the privilege you've been given. Just go ahead and praise him ahead of time. But some of you are going to experience a very different season. Some of you are going to experience family well enough, but it's going to be a broken family. And there's going to be anger. And there's going to be difficulty. And not only are you not going to feel valued, some of you know full well that in the hours in front of you, there are people you will have to spend time with who will devalue you. I want you to hear me. Your value does not come from the opinion of another human being. Your value comes from the price paid by the God of heaven who created you. Hear that, remember that, and pray this. You pray that God gives you, through the Holy Spirit, the right attitude, the right words, the right way to deal with the folks you're about to be around. You, you, look, look, look. Everybody look at me. Look here. I'm going to look at the camera so you can look at me, all right? Now look at me. Everybody got it? See in my eyes? Look in my eyes. I cannot speak to your family, but I can talk to you. We got to change you today. You let the Holy Spirit change you, and you'll change the situation. And if you don't, you'll at least come home in a few days knowing you did the right thing. Amen? 
and then there's some others of you that you won't experience family this season at all. In fact, you're likely over the next few hours to be alone. Maybe you're even going to be hungry. Perhaps even cold. You will ask yourself the question, do I really matter? Let me tell you what Satan's going to do in your mind. And I want you to hear me. In these moments, in these holidays, when everybody else is experiencing the warmth and the joy of family, what the devil's going to say to you is you don't matter. Nobody cares. Nobody's even going to notice if you're gone. Satan's going to begin to say crazy things to you. Like maybe you ought to just check out. Maybe it's time for you to get out of everybody else's way. I need you to hear me. God created you just the way you are. And I need to beg you. Here's here's the homework I have for you. Stop focusing on what you've messed up. And start focusing on what God made right to start with. Because every messed up person has some really right stuff about them. Find it, praise God for it, and live in it. Because God made you that way on purpose. And God will lift you up and you will not be alone. Pray that God opens doors for you to be with other people that care about you. And then listen to me, listen to me. When He opens the doors, go through them. Don't refuse the door just because you can't believe it might be for you. You have value today. You are your daddy's favorite. Everybody got that? Look at your neighbor and say, your daddy's favorite. Now look at the person just talked to you and say, no, you are. (laughs) Let me pray with you. Father God, I want to thank you. I want to praise you that you love us. I want to praise you, Lord, that our value does not come from our earning potential. I, I, just, I just praise you that our value does not come from some any economic measure. Thank you for that. Oh, if our value was in an economic measure, oh my word, so many of us would just be lost. But Lord, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. They can't measure our value in dollars, and that is so huge. Thank you, Lord, that our our value is not determined by the fickle nature of the society in which we live. A society that one day would think we're great and the next day would think we're useless. Lord, thank you that we're not held captive by a society that somehow assigns a value to us and then changes their mind tomorrow. Thank you that our value is not decided that way. Thank you, Lord, that our value is not decided by the citizenship that we hold. Oh, we praise you, Lord Jesus, for the United States of America. We praise you for this this country, and we praise you for the privilege of living here. We thank you, Lord, and we ask that you preserve this great union of ours. But, Father God, thank you that our value is even beyond that. As valuable and as wonderful and as as unbelievable as that is, our value is not based in that. Our value is based in who you are, not who we are. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for being our Creator. Thank you for being our Lord. Today, Lord, remind us. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm not going to try to get you to raise your hand or come forward. I just want you to deal with something. If you believe the next few days are going to be centered with people around you that love you and care about you, warm celebrations of family, I want you right now to begin praising God for that. Take this moment, and before any of that even happens, say, thank you, God. Praise Him. If you're expecting the next few hours to be difficult, confrontive, combative, would you stop right now and pray that God would give you a different spirit? God would give you the spirit and the words to deal with and bring calmness. 
the Spirit and the words to bring peace. The Spirit and the words to bring healing. If you believe the next few hours, they're going to leave you alone. Father God, for those who believe the next few hours are going to leave them alone, I pray at the very least, at the very most even, that the arms of the Holy Spirit would just wrap around each one in such a real and tangible way that we would know you are there. Remind us that our value comes from you because you love us. You love us not only enough to create us, but enough to hang out with us. And not only enough to hang out with us, but enough to die for us. And I pray you would bring people around. People who would love and care. People to bring warmth and comfort. We are all your children. Let us stand together in your presence. Let us give you praise. And let us joy, enjoy a merry Christmas because we serve a mighty Christ. We give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>